Good evening, listeners, and welcome to our 13th episode of The Phantom Myth. I've had quite a few warn me that 13 is an unlucky number, so let's hope nothing goes wrong with our broadcast tonight. Just to follow up from the last episode, I managed to speak with Mr. Sharp about the crates he received. He says he still hasn't opened the second crate, and they still haven't been claimed by his mysterious client. I find that I myself am curious as to the contents of the second crate. I am sure it's nothing supernatural, but give the strange nature of the contents of the first crate Well, it is interesting, isn't it? I, for one, would like to know more about both of the crates. Now, for tonight's episode, I chose a letter which seems to tie in with the last episode. This letter is from Cyril Clements, the owner of the Cloak and Dagger, one of the pubs on this island. He seems to be troubled by some lost memories. Oddly enough, not for a first in this show. The correlation between the stories is an interesting one, however. Dear Priscilla, My name is Cyril Clements, and I am the owner and proprietor of the Cloak and Dagger, I'm writing this letter because I've seen some really weird stuff. Look, I'm not worried about freaking out the customers anymore. After working in my pub for 15 years, I can honestly say that I have heard at least a thousand stories crazier than my own. Even if half of that stuff is real. Well, what happened to me seems like a drop in the bucket. This island is weird. I've never lived anywhere else, but I'm pretty sure stuff that happens here doesn't happen in any other places. I mean, the local news stories all around England seem to be about politics or disappearances or maybe a local church is trying to raise funds for a repair. We have those things. But we also have bodies with their eyes gouged out or symbols carved into their skin. I can't count the number of times it's been reported that somebody has disappeared and then a couple of days later it's revealed that nobody knows the missing person and they never existed. Most of us seem to have at least some unexplained gaps in our memories. Every night... Every single night, somebody comes into the pub to have a drink and tell me about a monster they've seen wandering through the woods or about a creepy dream that they were having and they didn't feel like they were actually asleep or something strange they saw their neighbour doing. One guy told me that as a kid, He wandered downstairs in the middle of the night to find his dad staring out of the window and laughing hysterically. But it was night and the lights were on, so all he could see was his own reflection. I didn't know what to say to him. This doesn't happen in other places. Why on earth is it happening here? My name is Cyril Clements, and I am worried I might be the reason this stuff is happening. (sighs) About a week ago, I was wandering past the empty shop front, the one that still has the faded Milton's Music Shop sign hanging above it. I blacked out. The last thing I remember was looking up at the boarded up windows and thinking what a shame that it was that the place had been closed for so long. Milton had been a good friend of mine and it was a shame what happened to him. Although, thinking about it, 
I don't know what happened to him. Does anybody remember? He was running the most successful music shop in town. He sold instruments and CDs and records and a few old cassette tapes. He taught piano lessons out of hours. He was a good friend of mine. But I don't remember how I met him. And I don't remember how he died. I don't remember if he is dead. What happened to Milton? Did he grow up here? If so, who was related to? Almost everybody on this island has bloodlines here that go back hundreds of years or longer. Who were his next of kin? Where did he die? Why don't I remember what happened to my friend Milton? A memory resurfaced that had once been buried so deep, so deep inside my mind that I did not know that there was a memory there to resurface. The door in the back of Milton's music shop. It opened, and beyond the door was a staircase that spiralled downwards, going nowhere. That was what I always called that place at the end of the staircase. I called it nowhere. I had been to nowhere. I had come back from nowhere. I didn't remember what nowhere looked like, but I do remember the trepidation I felt when the door opened and the relief I felt once I had escaped. What happened to Milton? I remember a dagger, not an actual dagger, just a pattern embroidered on some black fabric. And then I was home with two hours gone from my day. In front of me was a piece of paper and in my hand a pen. On the paper, the same question had been written over and over and over in my handwriting. My letters became bigger and loopier in the end. I think you can guess the question written before me. It is the same question I've been asking myself since it occurred to me that I didn't know the answer. What happened to Milton? I asked my friends. Nobody knew. Some people didn't remember Milton himself. They only recognised the name from the washed out sign hanging above the boarded up building. But he was a thriving business owner, wasn't he? A staple of the community. Everybody knew Milton, didn't they? I looked it up on the internet, and all I found was the Milton's music shop website. I looked in an old stack of newspapers kept at the local library. All I found was a small article announcing that Milton's music shop recently closed down. It was like been taken off the market now and it no longer had an owner. Not that it had passed over to family or that it had been claimed by the local council and they had decided not to sell the shop, just that it had no owner, as if it were a stray dog left to fend for itself. It didn't mention why it had closed down or why it had no new owner, let alone what had happened to the last one. I wanted to know. I needed to know. I should know. On my way back to work, I passed by Milton's music shop. I took the long route to work, the really long route. It was quite a walk, but I wanted to take another look at the place and see if there was any sign of what happened to me. I still don't remember how I got home. 
There was nothing about the shop that seemed off from the outside. It looked the same as it had every day since it closed down. So I peered through the hole in the boarded up window to see, and I glanced over to the door. They had boarded up the window of the door, but the door itself wasn't boarded shut. It could still, theoretically, be opened. I tried the handle. I don't think I expected it to be unlocked. I don't think I wanted it to be unlocked. But what I wanted didn't come into play. It was unlocked, and I needed to know what I would find inside that shell. A chill passed through me. It felt as if I had wandered into another world, one that was almost ours, but not quite. That doesn't make sense, but... I I didn't feel safe here. The air in the shop didn't feel stale like you would expect from a place that had been shut up for so long. Through the hole in the boarded windows, a small patch of sunlight broke through, and in it I could see the dust particles moving. The air was not still. Something had been in here. That something might still be in here. I shut out those thoughts, closed the door, and flipped the switch next to the door. The industrial lights flickered into life in just a moment. It was a shell of what it used to be. The plastered walls, the industrial lights hanging precariously from the ceiling on small hooks and swinging ever so slightly. This I found odd. There were no broken windows, and the door had been fitted perfectly into the frame. There should not be a draught in the shop, so why were these lights swinging? Maybe it was me, when I opened the door, but it was a still day and I doubt my movements alone would cause them to swing like that. There was something in here. I couldn't be sure of it, but I know what I felt. That feeling of eyes on me. The silence of somebody, something, staying ever so still. A stilted breath and careful movements, a horrid, squirming silence. The silence of not being alone. I crept over to the door, the one which had a little plaque which read, Staff. I turned the handle and pulled on the door, dreading what might be behind it. I'm sure you can imagine my relief and my disappointment when I found that whatever was behind the door had been bricked up. I left after that, turning the lights off as I did. You see, I didn't want any signs that I had been there. Who would press charges if no one owned the place? However, I felt I shouldn't be there, as if I didn't belong there. I left unsatisfied with what I had found, but trying to convince myself that my curiosity had been satiated. When I got to work, one of my waitresses, a nice girl by the name of Penny Thompson, asked if I was all right. She said I looked troubled. I asked her whether she had any gaps in her memory. She just looked at me with puzzled expression before sighing. You as well. She went on to tell me about her girlfriend a Miss Amelia Sparrow, and how she put her career at the Gage and Battle Law Firm in jeopardy since a weird encounter she had had with a man in green square-framed glasses. 
She told me that she had joined a group that believed otherworldly things happened on our island and that she also wrote a letter to you, Priscilla, that had made it onto your show. I will admit, I have always tried to have an open mind on the subject of the supernatural, but some of the stories I've heard, well, they just sound unrealistic. I understand that you, yourself, Priscilla, don't believe not in ghosts and ghouls or whatever the hell it was I saw. Well, maybe that's just what I need. I need to be told that things aren't as bad as I am worried they are. Anyway, I planned to write a letter to you and I decided I was going to not think about the things that I had remembered or what I had felt in Milton's music shop. But there was still that one question stuck in my mind. What happened to Milton? I worked my shift at the pub. The only weird thing happened there was that a guy came in and told me that he found a stack of papers in his desk drawer for a person with his surname, but a different first name. I asked if it could be family, but he told me he didn't have any family not even parents. I asked if he was adopted, and he said no. He just didn't have any family. Never did. This was normal. Well, it's certainly strange. But it was the usual kind of strange. My strange, or, well, my normal. I worked my shift, and I locked up the pub. And I set out for my home, putting any thought of going back to the abandoned shop. No, I was tired and I was going home and I had decided as such. I got home two hours later. What did I do in those two hours? I don't know. What I can tell you is that when I came to, sitting on my living room sofa... I was wearing a long, pale blue cloak. I immediately shrugged off the cloak as if it was toxic against my skin. It fell to the floor, and when I looked down, I saw a pattern sewn into the fabric. It looked like a knife of some kind, maybe a dagger. I think I laughed. The Cloak and Dagger. Who names their pub The Cloak and Dagger? Where did I get that name from? I decided to go back to Milton's music shop. I know I planned not to. I know that what I wanted to put the thoughts out of my mind. But this cloak, this dagger pattern... It was all too strange. Not my usual strange. I needed to know what I had forgotten. What I had been a part of. Why didn't I remember it? Not fully. Just a few fractured memories. I walked to the abandoned shop front. Just a faded sign and a shell of what used to be. Hiding something, something that could be, might be, truly evil. Inside, I found it looked much the same as it had before. The lights above had stopped swinging, and a thick layer of dust covered the counter and the shelves. The wooden floors below me were not dusty, however, and neither was the handle on the door with the plaque that read staff. I opened this door. I think I still expected to see those layers of brick, or at least what I had hoped. However, as the door swung forth, 
I found that solid brick wall had been broken. It looked like it had been caused by a sledgehammer, and some of the bricks removed. But most were now dust on the floor. I should stress that it wasn't me. I might trespass, but I certainly wouldn't purposely vandalise the place. Before me, steps twisted down and down to nowhere. I stared at them and realised something. However much I wanted answers, I could not make myself descend those stairs. I didn't want to go down to nowhere. I didn't want to see nowhere. I did not want to know what happened in nowhere. I wanted to remain here. This place this world. I don't think anyone should go to nowhere, but they had. I think I had. I remembered something else. It didn't seem to tie in with the rest. I remembered a white room and a man in green glasses. The memory held a special type of terror, one that I don't think I have a name for. I don't want to know. I don't want to remember. I want this to stop. Maybe this man can make it stop. What do I do? Am I imagining it all? If I believe impossible things are really true, Does it not just mean I've lost my grip on reality? Or is there something hidden in my subconscious under all the mundane things that I don't know, that I know? I think there is a terrifying secret hidden somewhere. I don't want to know it. Please, Priscilla, tell me I'm imagining it. That this is all some fiction of a damaged mind. I don't know what's happening, but what I can tell you is that almost everybody on this island either believes in the paranormal or they are scared they are losing their minds. What should I take from that? What should I believe in? Hmm. Well, This dagger symbol, it does seem to be cropping up quite a lot. I wish I knew the significance it had to this cult. Whether this cult actually exists is still very much up for debate on this island. And I, for one, I I have to admit there is something strange going on here. I myself have not suffered it from any gaps in my memory, as far as I know, but I know many people around Eastgrave have reported blacking out. Now, as far as I can tell, this kind of thing doesn't happen as often on the mainland or elsewhere in the world, but I think maybe that it could be attributed to another cause. I am not sure of what yet, but I can tell you this, that it is not supernatural in nature. Another thing that I picked up on this, if you listen to my third episode, the one with Arthur Smith's account of being in Milton's music shop, you might have noticed that he mentioned that the bulbs in the lights in the shop were broken. Myself and Harvey investigated the shop then, and we can confirm that the lights were broken then. Mr Cyril Clements, however, mentioned that they are working, and then he switched them on when he went to look around. Harvey and I went back there to see the place for ourselves. Unfortunately, 
The door to the staff room was locked, and neither of us thought it would be a good idea to commit vandalism, so we left it. We can confirm, however, that the lights now work. Somebody has replaced the bulbs. As for why somebody would do this to an old, abandoned shop, I do not know. I want to write this off as a figment of Mr. Clements's imagination, and I still believe the majority of it is just that. But there are some small elements that I cannot explain. I don't like leaving you, dear listeners, with such an uncertain answer. So I promise you this. I will find out what is happening on this island and what happens in the basement of Milton's music shop, even if it means I go down there myself. As for you, sleep well, dear listeners. The voice of Priscilla Phantom is Lindsay Evans. The Phantom Myth was written, edited and produced by Sasha K. Williams. If you have suffered with any unwanted, disturbing memories of places that could not exist in this world or any other, wow, you you are unlucky. Have a nice day.